Hi guys and welcome to another lesson in advanced woodcraft. Today we're going to do a, this is probably going to be a two-parter because this is more in depth. And it's something that we all hear about and we all, you know, oh I'll, I'll do that. But what happens when you break an axe handle in the field? Okay. A lot of people, uh, you always hear the thing that I'll just simply get the eye out of it and whittle me one off of a tree limb, okay? That is a field expedient, and it will probably work to get you out of a tight to get you back home. But once you get home, you have to properly seat a replacement handle into it because that random limb you cut off a tree and shaped to a rough shape, something like this, that's a lot of time and skill and I have personally done it. Um, trust me, I'll go buy a handle when I get home. But let's deal with it broke. Now, this video is really a continuation of a video that I started probably five or six years ago, maybe even longer than that. But I went and I was talking about um, I had broke the handle in my Norland camp axe. Now this axe was purchased in the 1960s and served long, hard, and well as the go-to field axe for taking camping, canoeing, etc. It was given to me by my mentor, Grouch McGowan, as a uh, reward for a noble deed, we shall say. And because of that, I cherish this axe. But I was on a 10-day canoe trip when the handle finally gave up. But you gotta understand, this ax was 50 years old then and had been used heavily. Let us talk about the wood. Let us talk about how to prep the eye. Let's talk about how to get that handle out and ways to begin to put this into the eye, okay? So first thing is, let us talk about the ax head. This is a Norland, and it's kind of like of a tomahawk pattern. See, flat on top, build down here. It has the elongated eye, and it will use a vertical wedge coming in from the top of it. It has a squared off hammer pole, and if you'll notice the edge, edge on, okay? It's got a pretty good bit of cheek. This is a general purpose used predominantly for splitting camp wood, okay? Now, how to tell the difference. I will show you a picture, a section here in a second, showing a thinner blade felling axe. Okay, this axe has a much thinner blade to it, see? Now, this one is a, like that. That's the size of it. Roughly comparable to that other one. But this has a much thinner head to it. This is a felling axe, a cutting axe, a chopping axe. The wood grain of a tree is in rings, right? If you're cutting sideways into that ring, something thin like this bites very deep. And so therefore it works as a felling axe. I cut trees down faster with it. But a very thin edge like this is not a good splitting axe. For a lot of woods because look how far you have to go from here down to here before it ever starts really swelling out about right there that much of the blade that means it would sink real deep cutting side grain but if i'm trying to split wood when it hit that deep it might get stuck easy where my other axe works better so this is just a little sidebar to talk about Looking at an axe, what's the job of the axe? This one is a felling cutting axe that does light duty splitting. The other one does better job as a camp axe splitter. This is, does better as a chopping slash felling axe. It'd be the same idea, but you see how that head is and the size of the eye in it. See, it's nice, full. That's what we're going for in this. Now you see how thin that blade is, and that's again designed to cut into the grain of the wood sideways for cutting in. Its weakness, as I said, is that when you go to split wood with it, it will bite so deep, but not have the power to throw the wood apart and wedge and split it so it gets stuck easy. So a felling axe 
is real common to get stuck trying to split wood. Where a splitting axe that's got more of a general purpose cheek on it is better for splitting wood and for general camp use. And yes, it will cut and fell a tree. Just realize that your strokes are not, your bites are not going to go that deep, like a half inch. We're up to an inch and a half with a real good soft wood and real powerful hit on that other one. Might cut as much as an inch, inch and a half into that wood, but it could wedge up, see? So this is a general purpose. And so I want to keep it on that angle because the job of this ax is a general purpose camp tool. It's going to be used predominantly for busting up a little bit of firewood and splitting firewood. Okay, so I want it in that position. Okay. Next, let's talk about the wood. Whenever the axe was king, before the days of chainsaws, you had a very in-depth um, precision force type deal of growth and pulling out and getting the absolutely best wood, the absolutely perfect grain for axe handles for that logging industry. That isn't true anymore. Today the chainsaw is king and other mechanical methods for dropping trees and the axe has been dropped back to a job of limbing and you know hand work, grubbing work, that type deal. So the axe is not the king that it once was and the wood has gone the same way. Why should I take premium hickory with beautiful straight grain and turn it into an axe handle when I could turn it into something else? that would be much more valuable, like a veneer or something like that, where I can make a whole lot more money. So the ax handles today are not the highest quality they used to be. Plus, back in the day, you had old growth timber. What that means is trees from the thick forest had to fight for every speck of sunlight they got. And because of that, the tree rings grew, the trees grew slower and they grew denser. And so a uh, given size hunk of wood from 1900 that was grown and harvested then is a whole lot heavier than the same type of wood grown today. The rings are wider apart and it's just because our forests are more open, cleared, and it grows faster. So it's not as high quality of wood, okay? Now, let's talk about the grain. In a perfect world, I would want an axe handle that the grain runs exactly, when I'm holding it like this, straight up, straight down. It doesn't weave in or out, it is straight up, straight down. So that whenever I chop an impact, it would, like that, take, like your fist, a that wide a slab flexing because the wood acts as a shock absorber and also as a spring to a point. So that whenever you take the axe and you swing and you hit, Whenever the impact occurs, your body keeps wanting to torque that wood. That wood kind of bends a little bit, like loading up like a bow, and helps drive that axe head further in to the target. So I want that grain straight. If this grain is twisted off to the side, not even a lot, but just like that, what that means is on impact, it wants to twist that way. It wants to go the way of the grain. And so have you ever had an axe that you rear back and when you hit it felt like it twisted in your hand? That's probably why. The grain is probably a little off. And so it wears where your grip is, rubs blisters on your hands, and will eventually fail because it's not dead on straight. Good luck finding a dead on straight. Today it's very difficult. And so if you can find a store that has multiple axe handles where you can pick one up and look at it, by all means do. Now this one is running relatively straight. There's a little bit of a warp to it, but not bad. But it's relatively straight grained all the way through. Okay. Next, after you've got a piece of wood that is the proper length and etc. Do you put the head on? And I've heard this so many times in my life. Oh my God. About, well, all you got to do is you put it up there and you just take a hammer and you beat it on. Your axe head will never fit right. I tell you why. Because, yes, you can beat this on by beating on the metal onto it, and you'll beat it down on there in position. But what you're doing is you're actually doing it wrong, and you're causing the wood to be put under attention. Okay, we shall say. And let's understand that. 
the wood grain of this wood again is like a spring think like a bow and arrow okay so that whenever this is put in there and you go to beating down on it the grain coming up here because obviously this don't go up in here it's gone right well, there's edges of grain sticking up here. And as I beat down, those edges of grain are being bent out like that, and they're being done this, and they're tearing and ripping off. This does not make a beautiful, smooth, completely filled axi. It means it's ragged and it's pushed out, and the grain doesn't work. The proper way to do it is to fit the eye into it and then hit it on the bottom and let the axe head walk its way up. Why is that different? Because the shock wave of hitting the wood acts like a, think of a bristle brush. It jumps the wood forward and allows those grains to kind of flex forward. So they kind of flex and pop forward, flex and pop forward. I'm swedging this wood into that eye rather than beating it into the eye. If I beat it in, it's cutting it. If I swedge it in by smacking it on this end, it fits in and the grain of the wood is more relaxed. When I get it all the way bottomed out and I give it that good walk, walk, walk on the end and it's not going anymore. Those last walks on the butt end of it are actually shockwaves that's causing it to still try. But any grain that's kind of hung up gets a chance to kind of, you know, flex. It's like you put that jacket on and you get, okay, yeah, okay, work your shoulders around. And I make it a very smooth, even grain. Now we're going to make sure that this is a 100% fill. And that is the weakness when I see most people do axes is that you'll pick it up and you'll look at it, and yeah, the axe is on there. Then you look down to the top, and there's all these gaps. It'll work for a while, but if there's any gap between that eye and that axe, in the act of chopping, you're flexing it, remember? And if there's a gap, well, I can flex into there, and it starts, those fibers start working around. They start cracking, they start splitting, they start, and that's why that head just as loose as it can be, and you rear back with a full power swing, and it just comes off. However, if it's swaged in there, where the, there is no voids, there is no gaps, this is 100% friction fit, where it's actually a little too big, but it's wedged in there. And it can't come out. It grips it no matter what. Now, the moisture content of the wood, when they take this wood and it's green, it has to be dried. That's what we, you'll hear the term kiln, K-I-L-N, dried. That means they put it in a place and they raise the temperature so the water content comes down. But you do not want truly dry wood. There's a, a level like 10 or 12 percent of water content left. When you cut this green, it's actually more water weight than it is wood. And the wood weight is going to drop radically until it gets down to about that 10 percent. Okay, you've got a broke axe handle. You're in the field. What do you do first? Well, if you have tools and ability with you, I recommend using tools of taking a cold chisel or something and just start splitting it until you finally drive the wood out of it. You don't have that. Okay, then you're going to have to do the method of bury and burn. What you're going to do is you're going to dig a hole down. You're going to add a little bit of water to the ground, not soapy mud, but make it a little damp, okay? And you're going to pack it up to about where my hand is. So just that eye sticking out of the ground. And you're going to pack hard dirt. I mean, get up here and jump on it all the way around. Pack that dirt as tight as you can get it. Okay? And then I'm going to build a fire around the top of it. Something like pine straw. Something that's a flash fire. Quick. I'm just going to keep adding pine straw. Until I get that to burn. Okay? I want pay, If I already got a campfire going, which I should have... Put coals on either end and then put pine straw around out here and let that heat. Pushing those coals up against that, get it burning. Once I get it burning, fan it. Burn it like you're burning out a bowl in a spoon or a kookska or something until you get it out of there. But you want it buried and you want this down here to remain as cool as possible because it will take the temper out. If you just put the whole axe head in there, it'll get hot. Yes, it'll burn out. Yes, and then there's no temper left in this thing possibly and it's dead soft and it'll bend, break, chip, or whatever. Or, there's also the possibility that what happens if this happens in the dead of winter and it's 15 below zero out here and I burn this thing out. When I pull it up out of the ground, the air can be so cold it can cause a temper problem. So I don't like to burn them out if I can avoid it. 
If I got no other choice, that's it. I have taken hardwood wedges before and I something else and beat the wood out. And that's what I did when it broke originally. And then I took my original axe handle. You notice this big shoulder right here. It had split right through here and this part had come off. I cut it off flush. I took my pocket knife and I necked this down and I refitted it to an eye and got it back on there. And I used it for that, plant, for that camp out. But you burn it out if you have to. You to use tools if at all possible to avoid that, okay? When I get out of the field with that broken off axe head with my improvised axe handle, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna get me a good axe handle. I'm gonna look and find a good one. I'm gonna take my time because I want this done, done right so I don't have to do it again, barring accident for another 40, 50 years, okay? So you've got the eye out of it. Now, what's the first thing you do? Well, you're gonna come up here and you're gonna look on the inside. This is where the axe handle is gonna come up from this side. I do not want any sharp edge on this side. I don't want it digging into the wood, again, causing voids. I will take a file. And I will start beveling that and make sure that there is no sharp edge anywhere on that eye. The side of a file has got teeth on it. I can use it like a round file to get in there and sat down here. Feel of it. No sharp edge. Also go across the top. Also make sure while it's off. If this back edge has flared up back here, now's the time to lock it in a vise and get rid of those little wafflies where you pounded tent stakes and stuff. Go ahead and bevel over the edge of that eye and make sure that we ain't got any wire edges or anything like that. Once I've got my eye prepared, then I go to my wood. Now, as I said earlier, you've selected a piece of wood where the grain is going straight up, straight down no weave or nothing to it in a straight line this way. So like my fingers, and this is a way to remember, put your hand at the back, the grain should go like your fingers, straight up, straight down, okay? Now, I want to fit the first test fit. I wanna fit this eye to this head. So what I wanna do is I wanna face it in the correct direction. Trust me, how many times I've seen people put one in backwards? facing in the correct direction and I want to sit it up there and see if it'll start. If it will not, I want to bevel it a little bit to make it fit in there. Remember, it's got a split in it. So that will give it a little bit of a springy. You want that. We'll refine that a little later on. But I want to put that point in first and then roll it up. It should, you see how this one done? Because I've already fitted it one time. Put it in, roll it up, it should fit in there. Then once I've got it on there square, I push it down to where it just snugs with my hand, okay? Where I can turn it upside down and just wiggle, wiggle, wiggle and push straight in with my hand till it snugs up like that. Then you begin your first pounding. I like to use a dead blow hammer so I don't bugger up the back of the ax. If you look at the ax handle right here, you see this flat spot right here? That's what that's for. Hanging it by taking your fingers and just going around loosely. See, so it won't go any further down your hand. Just let it hang there like that. Holding out here in the air. You want to smack that right there. And go to it stop. Now you saw how I just did that and it walked all the way down because I fitted it. It should come down and at some point it's going to bind up. That's fine. When it binds up, take it back off. Turn it back around. Now grab the axe handle, axe head, and lightly tap straight down. Again, don't get in a hurry and don't pry in and out. You're going to mark it. All I want to do is get it done. See how I'm doing now? I'm taping up, tapping up, and getting that wood to pull out. All right. Once I have done that, you see how that's 
raise right there, that burr, that tells me where I got to, and I should scrape from there. Now, in the past, us old woodsmen, we'd find broken plate glass, broken uh, glass that was in like a, a big storefront window, aquarium, fish aquarium glass, and that stuff would be saved as scrapers because we used it to scrape wood to get wood down close without using sandpaper or whatever. That was the way we did it. But for modern times, I went online and got a set of wood scrapers off Amazon. And all these are are pieces of metal that have a 90 degree edge on them so that you can scrape wood with them, okay? So I would come up here, I would see where my line came with. Now remember how these grains are going? Grains are going straight up and straight down. So this right here is all in grain. Every bit of that is in grain, and that is where the grain of the wood is coming, being cut off to form this shoulder. So if I pull back against that, what's going to happen? It's going to flare up like pages of a book. I want it to lay flat, so I want to scrape away from me. So I'm going to take like that, and you see that fine little shaving right there? And I take, and I push away from me, nice and slow and even, slowly turn it. Where these edges are right here, I hook them, and I start doing it. I'm going to fine take off, paper thin, every stroke right there. Wherever it's binding up, and don't do too much on the very point or the very back. We want that to fit, but don't remove a lot or it'll leave a gap. After I have done a few and I got a little bit test fitted again. Take it, put the point in, bring it up, wiggle her down till she binds, turn her upside down, take it. Now notice how the, time, the sound changes. Let me tap that down again. I want you to listen. Listen close, okay? Ready? It starts out sounding kind of hollow and then sounds more solid, doesn't it? That's as it reaches it. Now, once it gets here, I need to look at it and make sure it ain't tipped or whatever, because it could be. You know, it could have wanted naturally to go down and this bib's a little fur down. I want, from my straight up and down, I want my edge straight out, not down at an angle, okay? So, I can adjust it a little bit. If this is a little bit down on the bottom but not on the back, I'm going to want to relieve that little burr right there and right there that's standing up because that's what's in the way right now. It's acting as a break and keeping it from going back there. Very fiddly. Now, as you can see, see that wood sticking up, that end grain right there? That wood sticking up, that end grain all the way around? Now, I want to take this and I want to go against it. Now, if it's too thick, I may have to take a pocket knife. I'm going to take my pocket knife. And I'm going to come from this going to the end. Remember where the grain is. And I'm going to just slowly slice it up and off. Make that burr go away. Right here on this end, same thing. That way I'm not rolling up the grain. Just like that. Okay. Now 
Now once I got the big burr out of the way, take your file and go across real light. So if there's any fiber right there sticking up, I will cut it off. I'll whisker it off. I still feel it pretty good right there. On the end on the side of a file are teeth. Lay your finger up there to guide it. Take off that grain. Just like that. Go back to the scraper. Now eventually, it's gonna shoulder out. And that's what this is. This is the, the swellers, the shoulder. I want it to shoulder out right there. But I don't want that, that grain flared or under tension, remember? Because when I go to chopping, it's gonna do that. And I get a split out up here. Uh-uh. I'm doing this once in 25 years. So I'm going to sit there and do this. Dig it in and take it down until that burr, that shoulder, is gone. Just like that. Now once I've got it down pretty close, I'm going to take sandpaper and I'm going to go across the grain using my thumb right there at that shoulder to whisker it off. I don't want any of those grains sticking up. Okay. A little bit here, there. Now you see that darkness right there? That's where the axe is biting. That's good. Take sandpaper and just lightly rough it up. Just lightly to break the shine. Now, put it back on. Okay. Now, I have shouldered all the way around. So it's raising up right where I wanted it to be. Now looking at it from the top, I can see a little bit of a gap right there. That's simply because this wood, to start out with, wasn't quite big enough for this eye. Awful close. But I'm gonna fill that in when I get to the actual seating. But I have now got my eye up there on it. I've got my head on it. Take it, hold it out there and straight, and look down it. Is there any twist to it? Is it straight up, straight down? Now's the time to do something about it. Is it on there solid? Appears to be no wiggle, wiggle side to side. I could possibly, because that got talked it this way, but no, there isn't. And that's what I want. I want it to feel snug right now where I can't by hand twist that accent around. It's on there, it's good and tight. So I have fitted the head to the handle. Now, the next step will be to finish the handle. Because I've got it down there, okay? Now remember that scraper? Remember the direction the grain is going? I want, notice this bird's eye right here where that grain is not straight up. I want to start with the bullseye and I want to go away from the bullseye. If I go toward the bullseye, what am I going to do? Roll up grain, which will make it whisker, and I don't want to do that. So that bullseye right there going this way is the way I'm going to do it, going away from that. Real fine, real light. Now I'm going to change direction and take the bullseye and go toward the head. Take your time. 
back here on the back where the grain is running straight up and down I can just pull it nice and smooth but notice how the handle has been set to this so this is in grain right here if I go that way I'm chattering go with it and you get where you can feel it you feel you're going with the grain instead of against the grain just like as my granddaddy taught me so it's like petting a cat it'll tell you right quick when you're doing it wrong and so I'm gonna just shave it to get down any raised grain going with it just like that now over here on this side you see because the way they cut it out the grains going that way now I need to change direction and go this way you do it by feel you'll figure it out so go with it go with the grain and you want to sand it now if you don't have a nice fancy scraper like Blackie's got right here you use sandpaper steel wool's good too start with a little bit of coarse steel wool and just go over it lightly just like that now what you're going to do is you'll feel it it's like going against the grain again so you'll figure out which way to go with this and just whisker it I'm taking off all those fine little grains because once you cut the wood into this shape those little bitty hair fine want to do that and you come along and you hit this and want to bend them like bending your fingers so you figure out which way to go with it go with the grain and just lightly pet it and my granddaddy would say pet the cat and it'll start getting smooth and shiny that's what we want and we're going to do this whole handle until this whole handle is smooth and shiny now from about here to here I can go this way but about right here is where that grain changes direction because of the way it does so I got to reverse and come this way you can see a fine little dust I'm bringing off of it. Coarse, coarse, and I shoved it up under her fingernail. Just like that, shine it. In a good light, you can actually see it start to shine. Now, once you've got it, got it sanded down whiskered where it's smooth it's as smooth as you think you're gonna get it that's when I recommend you finish the axe and we're gonna talk about that in the next step now two schools of thought here right now it's good and wedged in there and all I got to do is cut off this excess put a wedge in and I got an axe right now but let's pay some dividends for down the line again I don't want to have to do this again for 25 years so let's look at what happened. I've whiskered it. I've got it nice and smooth. It feels just like it's butter. I want to put it up and I'm going to leave it for 24 hours. I'm going to come back and I'm going to run my hand over it. Does it feel rough again? Did those fibers that I just cut off stand back up? I may want to take a wet paper towel and wring all the water out of it I can get out and then just wipe it to get the dust off of it, stand it up in the corner and leave it overnight. Tomorrow when I come back from work and I check it, I bet you it'll feel rough again because those fibers stood up, right? It's called whiskering. Now I want to redo it with my steel wool. I'll go to a finer steel wool now, and I want it to do it. And then I'll whisker it again tonight and put it up. After three days of whiskering it, and when I'm down to four-aught steel wool, it should be like it's polished. It's going to feel like it's finished by then, okay? Now I want to remove the head, and I want to finish, start the finishing. We're going to cover that in the second one, but let me show you one more point right quick. Okay, you've got the handle nice and smooth, ready to go. 
notice that crack right there? That's where your wedge is going to go in. Okay? So when you get this ready to go, you're going to put the wedge in, and it's going to wedge it out and take up any remaining slack in there and fill that up, right? All right. At the bottom of that crack right there, all it is is that's been sawed and it's split out, and there's fibers right there. What I like to do is at the bottom of that is I take a real tiny drill bit, and I go through there straight through from both sides. I want it round bottomed because in the long life of this axe and chopping and everything, I don't want shock and everything to cause that crack to keep running. Remember how my old axe handle busted? It split off on one side because whoever had done it originally, the factory I believe, had not done that. And over 50 years of use, that crack had run, run, run till it got out here. And then it's not supported. Pop, and there it went. See. So I want to round the bottom of that. Now, as a preview of what's coming, I will take the ax, I will, like you can see right now where I just knocked up a little bit more burr, I'll get rid of all the burrs. I want this thing as slick and polished. I will go through and I will open up that gap a little bit so that my wedge goes in and it's round bottom now and it doesn't split out. I will then finish this. I will stain it and then I'll apply my finishes, just like I would for a gun stock or anything else. Once I get it done, but I'm not gonna worry so much about this top piece that's sticking up. In fact, I'll put an X up there when it's back in the, the ax head back on it to show me what's being cut off. I ain't gonna worry about finishing up here. So I'll tie my rope there to hang it up. When I paint on the finish and let it dry, then I'll lightly sand it down. I'll put two or three coats on this, okay? My axe head, I'm gonna paint because I want it to not rust. So I'll paint and leave the edge protected. I'll run a little bit of uh, masking tape or whatever along the edge and I'll spray that head down with a good rust preventative paint, a couple of coats on it and let it dry thoroughly, okay? Now, when I do my assembly, this will be finished, the head will then be ready to go on. On this wood right here, I will coat it with an epoxy, okay? I will then put a good gob of epoxy up here on the top, and I'll take a thread, and I will run it between the two, and I'll jiggle back and forth, bringing that epoxy down between those two halves to get it in there. Then I'll put a gob up there, and I'll put that head on, and that Epoxy will fill 100% any gaps. I want it to force out anything. I'll protect the finish with tape and aluminum foil. You're going to see all this. And I'll protect the head. That way, whenever I squeeze it in there, it will fill up 100% any gaps that are left. I want 100%, no air gaps, no nothing. And it's completely filled. And all the way to the bottom of that gap is glue, epoxy. I will then put in my wedge and I'll pound that sucker home, good and tight. And we'll set it aside for 24 hours and let it dry. Then I will cut off the excess and I will then seal off the top of that end grain so I don't get water in from the top. And then my ax is complete. But that'll be coming up in part two. If you've enjoyed this content, do me a favor and hit the like, share, and subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. And until next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.